Good morning and welcome to Wesley Chapel United Methodist Church. I'm Gary Moore and I serve here. If you'll join me as we affirm our faith in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and in remembrance of our baptism as we recite the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day He rose from the dead, He ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence He shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. If you will now join me in the prayer that our Savior taught us to pray. Bow your heads and repeat after me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. What a beautiful day the Lord has blessed us with. I told you that my sharing during prayers and concerns was best used maybe as an illustration for the sun. Yeah, right there. See how it works. I hope I remember to walk off the, behind the pulpit on this side. If I, if I get tangled up and fall, don't laugh, please. First, I want to confess something. Um, months ago, my uncle was diagnosed with uh, late-stage prostate cancer. How it, how it went undetected, nobody knows. He's very diligent and stuff like that. But, um, and they said that it was, um, it was not going to be pretty. The, the, the prognosis wasn't good. They live on the West Coast. I've, I know my uncle, but they grew up, you know, I grew up here, and they, they've always lived on the West Coast, so I, um, he was a he was an NFL coach for thirty or forty years. When they ever come into town and play, that's when I would mostly see him. Um, whenever they played a game out here, but I could tell that my my aunt and my mother were wanting me to call and pray for him. But there was for some reason, and I I confess this that um, I was scared to. I was scared to. Um, not that I don't love my uncle. Not that I don't love my mother or my aunt, but I didn't know if he would understand the prayer that I would pray. You see, because um, I just didn't feel that just to call and pray and, and give platitudes and, and just say, Uncle Johnny, it'll be all right. You know, you're a good man, you've got good doctors, you've got good medical care, it'll be all right. And I, I know that's probably what a lot of people would pray, but it's not what I pray, and it's not what I wanted to pray. Because I wanted to pray this, and this is what I did pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, come down and heal my uncle. Do what you said you would do. Have somebody lay hands on him and anoint him and heal him. Because that is the God that I worship. That is the God I see in Scripture. And that's the, the prayer that I prayed. I was, I was afraid. I was like, if I call him and do that, he's either going to think I'm crazy and one of them. And he might dismiss it. And I didn't want to do that. And I didn't, and I have to admit, I was, I just didn't want to be humiliated if he didn't take it. You know, if he took it the wrong way. But that was my prayer in my heart. And I prayed it earnestly. And when we, when we had a, a proxy anointing up here the other uh, two or three weeks ago, that was that was who I was thinking about, my uncle Johnny, and I and I just knew, you know, and I started to send him the, a little vial of oil, and I said, "Hey, just anoint yourself. Get your wife to anoint you every morning. You know what can it hurt, right? 
I mean, when you're, when, you're, when you're late stage cancer, what have you got to lose? But why do we have to wait for that point? Why do we have to go? And, and why can't we pray in boldness? Why can't we call on God to be who He says He is? We see the psalmist do it all the time. The psalmist always says, Lord, we need You, and then he doesn't hear from God. So he, he just you know, goes back to Him again and says, hey, be this. Be the God that You said You would be. Hold, stand you. I'm gonna hold you to your promises. We see the psalmist do it all the time, but we don't pray that way. And I was afraid to pray that way for him, but I prayed in my heart and I prayed in my private space. And this week, my mother called. I thought she was returning my call, but no. She called and said, "I don't know if you've heard, but Johnny had a good report." I don't. I don't know a lot about cancer, but I think they said it's not in the blood or it's not in the bone. It's not metastasized or something. It's good report. Ooh. And I was like, you know, the prayers, the prayers. I just went. I kept, you know, I kept telling God I want a healing. That's what I want. I don't, I don't want him to be better. I want him to be healed. I don't care what it takes. I don't care if it takes a... Uh, Anderson Cancer Clinic, I don't care what it takes. All the machinery and the technology, I don't care what it takes. Heal the man. Because I know that he'll stand up and go, I've been healed. And he'll give you the credit. Even if the doctors were involved. You know you got to involve doctors in healings. And medical technology and stuff. It's got to be a part of it. So I'm calling him today. And I'm going to pray my heart out. If he likes it, <clears throat> but why was I scared of that? That's, that's the strange thing. Why was I scared to say that to... Because I know he's been in church. He was part of the Christian Fellowship of Athletes and all that. I know he's a strong Christian. I don't know. I didn't, just didn't know how he would take on me calling a healing on him. Amen? Today's... Lectionary Scripture speaks of a woman who, I have to tell you, I, 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 when I gave this Scripture to the, the worship team, I was like, I'm, I'm, I'm very uncomfortable preaching this Scripture, but I, I just feel it's, i, I got to challenge myself to do it. Because I see in this that Jesus said, I, I have to tell you the truth, I don't like. Uh, it's a side of Jesus that you just don't... Um, well, it's very uncomfortable. It's very uncomfortable. Uh, it reminded me of um, be careful what you say because um, as a Christian, because that's what people will hear. You can profess Jesus Christ, you can come to church, and then you can go out to work in another environment and you just flip. You just go the other way and, and you know, people go, wow, that doesn't look like a Christian. I can remember seeing that growing up in my, my grandparents and things. They went to church every Sunday, but every once in a while, I'd hear something come out of their mouth and I'd be like, oh, wow. Woo! Man, <clears throat> that was sharp. And it had a lot to do with why I did not proceed into the church as a young adult. Amen? I, I, I guarantee you I'm not the only one that heard Christians say one thing when they were in the present. I get it all the time, man. I, I, at work and stuff, I'm still out there and people go, how you doing, Reverend? How you doing? Praise God. Holy. Woo! Feel the Holy Spirit now. And then, and then and just turn right around. And it's just like... I'm like, woo! Man. And if I walk you know, into a room and I catch them, they go, oh, sorry, Pastor. I'm like, don't apologize to me. I are one of you. I'm a sinner too. Don't apologize to me. Apologize to the big guy. But we do that, and, and it, this Scripture bothered me so much because I see Jesus do it. And it's not the, the you know, it, it paints a picture of not a Jesus with the, the lambs all around Him and the children, you know, and, and what we see in Sunday school. And it's kind of disheartening. But let's talk about a little context before we get into it because that's where I had to go to figure this out. Just, just dig into the context and why would Jesus say such a thing to to a person <clears throat> such as this. And the context is, is that in the 15th chapter of Matthew, we see that, that Jesus has already been arguing with the Pharisees on many different points, right? 
And it says when he retreats that it's because he's under assault. That, that Greek word means it's only used when someone is under assault. So when he retreats, he's retreating from his safety, he's retreating from somebody coming in. The scripture today is 15, chapter 15 of Luke, um, verses 10 through um, Matthew. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, 10 through 28, I believe. Uh, well, what the context is, um, is, is Jesus' uh, Jesus's ministry is still very young. Still very young. He's still talking to the, in the synagogues and he's still trying to convert the Pharisees and his people, the Jewish people. Uh, and he's getting a lot of resistance, a lot of combativeness. Um, and so we see that he's probably a little on edge. And so then he starts in uh, chapter 10 or verse 10. Then he called the crowd to him and said to them, Listen and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but it is what comes out of the mouth that defiles. So he's, he's talking about dietary laws. The, the Pharisees have said, how come, you're, how come your disciples there ain't washing their hands? And how come they're eating unclean stuff? And so he's going to answer that. But he says, what, It's not what goes into the body that defiles it, it's what comes out of the body that defiles it. Then the disciples approached him and said, Do you know that the Pharisees took offense when they heard what you said? I kind of think Jesus probably went, Yeah, I bet they did. <laughs> that was the whole point. He answered, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind guides of the blind. And if one blind person guides another, both will fall into a pit. But Peter said to him, Explain this parable to us. Then he said, Are you also still without understanding? I told you how much I began to love Peter last week, right? He's still, he, he's growing on me. Do you not see that whatever goes in the mouth enters the stomach and goes out into the sewer? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and that is what defiles. For out of the heart, come evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile. Amen? That's not, that's not the text we're going to really concentrate on. But you know, once you say something, it never comes back. It floats out there forever and ever and ever. <coughs> People remember... And if, and if you, t if you profess to be a, a disciple of Jesus Christ, people remember that hold against, not only hold it against you, they'll hold it against Christ. And they'll test you and push you into doing things like that. And that's the assault that, that you talk, you speak of. That when you step out in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you can bet that somebody's going to be there to assail you. Yes, amen. I get an amen on that right there because somebody's hearing what I'm saying. Amen? And so this is where it really got disturbing for me. All right, now the woman, is, is she's a Canaanite. The Canaanites um, in the, from the city of uh, Tyre and Sidon, which in the time of David and Solomon were, had an alliance with Israel. Um, the, the, the King Hiram gave materials to build Solomon's temple and craftsmen. So they had an alliance, but uh, as with most things, there was an alliance built on a marriage, and you know one of those marriages was Jezebel? She comes right in here. But those things have deteriorated, and so now um, those people in the north, up now where Lebanon is, that, that relationship's falling apart. And so you know, they're, not, they're not on good terms with each other. So here's, here's where it gets dicey for me. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then, a Canaanite woman, that's to distinguish that this is someone who is not in favor or not living in favor with the Israelites and the, the, the God of the Israelites. This is uh, an opponent, not a proponent. So she's a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, now, this is where it ties in to praying for my uncle. This is, this is 
and, and for us and for you. Have mercy on me, Lord, Son of David. First words out of her mouth are, you are the Messiah. Son of David is a designation. She's acknowledging, you are the Messiah, you are the Son of David. She's giving him acknowledgement that the Pharisees don't even give him. And, they, and she's not even an Israelite. She, doesn't even, she might not even be monotheistic, you know? So, and then, he, then her supplication, my daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. That's the first disturbing thing. He did not even show compassion in that moment. He just dismissed her. I guess he thought she would go away. But he did not answer all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, send her away, for she keeps shouting at us. Amen? Now I'm thinking, they don't really care whether you heal the daughter, or you just keep walking, or just rebuke her and tell her to go on away. Just do something to get this pesky woman out of here. And he answers, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. A true statement. A true statement. At this point in his ministry, he is still here for Israel. He still here is the messianic person for the Israelites. So he says that dismissively. I'm not even going to deal with her. I'm not here for those people. I'm here for my people. But she came and knelt before him in acknowledgement that he's Lord. Amen? She came and knelt before him saying, Lord, help me. And this is that moment when he says something that just destroyed me. It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dog. Oh man, that is so much not the Jesus that I have heard about and read about, that I worship, that I pray to. Who is this Jesus? And to tell somebody that they're a dog is bad. Dog, dogs didn't sit at the table and sleep in Master's bed in those days. Not like today. Not a lot of pet smarts around. Not a lot of videos. But it's not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. And she said, and listen, she is so smart. She is so smart. Yes, Lord. Yet yeah, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the Master's table. Amen. Do you realize what she just did? She took the teaching of Christ, just like a psalmist, just like Moses did. You remember how many times, Moses, two times distinctly, Moses had to go to God and say, I don't think you want to go down this path. After they made the golden calf, right? And, and God was really mad about that. And, and he said, be careful what you do right here. Careful what you do, people are looking. And then before they walked into the promised land, they did it again. He said again, he did not do it. And Moses said, you can't abandon them now. Because people, people, if you're God, then you've got to act like God. Right? And, and God acquiesced them, didn't He? He did. So this shows how, how when we pray and how we supplicate to God, and, and the psalmist always says, after he's rejected, he says, but you're the God that you told me. You're the God that told me to come to you for these things. And here I am pleading to you, begging for you to do something. And I expect you to be God. I, my faith is on your promises. Amen? My, my faith is in the trust that I put in you. Now show me that you're the God that you say you are. And that seems highly offensive. We don't want to be that assertive in the church anymore. But we've really got to start praying that in the day and times that we're on and in. You've got to start praying boldly and, and, and asking God, not please come in, Heavenly Father, but Heavenly Father, come in and help us. Help me. Help my family. Because we can't make heads or tails out of this. We're, we're wandering around in the desert and we don't know where to go. Lord, come in and be our God once again. But we have to give Him that authority. 
When we ask Him in and we submit that authority to Him, we have to be obedient. And that's all He really wants us to do is just be obedient. He doesn't want us to come up with a plan. He doesn't say figure it out for yourself. He says, I'm just going to tell you to be obedient. When I tell you to do something, do it. Don't, don't worry about the results. Don't worry about how it's going to play out, what it's going to look like. You just be obedient. But I love this because the woman takes it and she goes, yeah, you know, you're right. I am a dog. But then she turns it right back on and just like the psalmist does like Moses did. But give me what the dog is due. Amen? If, if I'm a dog and, and only the crumbs come off the table, then give them to me. Amen? She said, I'll be satisfied with the crumbs. You call me a dog? Okay. But give the dog what the dog gets. And that's the crumbs from the Master's table, and I'll be happy. And I think Jesus knew He'd been caught right there. You know? And she says, yes, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the Master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. I can just see the look on His face. She got me on that. And He didn't give her the crumbs. Do you see that? He did not give her the crumbs. He gave her the full blessing. Amen? And her daughter was healed instantly. Amen. Because she, she did not take the rejection. She boldly said, I'll accept my position in this structure. But give me what's due. And I'll be happy with that. I tell you, I don't know about y'all, but that, that one, when I get to that part about the dogs and he calls her a dog, it just crushed me. It just crushed me. But the greater story is, is that she persevered. This book is full of perseverance. People that walk in the, in the, in, in the, in the, in the boldness of, of God, bad things happen to them. It's like what we said a little while. You don't, you don't know that God is everything until God is all you've got. If you've never been there, there's a good chance you will be there at some point. And I hope your prayers aren't, uh, oh, why me, Lord? Oh, why me? But it will be there. They've, they've been my prayers many times. Why me, Lord? Why, why are you allowing this to happen? The people came about across beside me in my family, and prayed boldly in our presence. You've heard me talk about intercessors, intercessory prayer, people that come. We are intercessors for people. People came up and, and prayed boldly, and proclaimed things for me and my wife when I couldn't do it. To hold God accountable, there's nothing wrong with that. Somebody, I forget who I was talking to, might have been one of y'all, said, uh, be with him. He's a little mad at God right now. That's okay. People think you can't get mad at God, but I'm going to tell you, God would rather have the dialogue than for you to walk away. Amen? He stayed talking to Job the whole time. People say, um, what do they say about uh, Job, the persistence of Job or something? The what? Patience. I didn't see a lot of patience in that book. You know? I just never picked up on the patience. What I heard was a guy having a, a direct conversation with God and, and airing out what his feelings were and wanting to know why it was happening. That's the message I got out of that. He told me that God's a big, big guy, a big guy. He can handle it, you know? He can take our questions, our poignant questions. Where are you, God, and why are you doing this? But when we pray those prayers and we need to pray boldly, just... just God just gives you the crumbs. Just take the crumbs because the crumbs are enough. God's crumbs are enough for us. I want you to... I want you to step your game up. Amen? I want you to step your game up. This is... Um, heck, that's all I ever want us to do. Step our game up. Be the best... Don't, don't just be a church goer. Just don't be a believer in Christ. Be a disciple of Christ. 
If you, if you profess and you take the, the, the sacrifice that was given on that cross, if you take that and, and, and you take it as a cleansing to stand justified before the Lord God Almighty from what was done on that cross, you owe Him much more than you're giving Him. I do too. There's no, you can't outgive that. But you were purchased with that. And so what you do after you're purchased, you'll be held accountable for. Live in the grace of Jesus Christ. And do it in every aspect of your life. I just think we should do that. As a church, as a group, just think what would happen. We live in a good community. Amen, this is a great community. But there's people slipping through the cracks all the time. I ride down the road. You can see dysfunctional households. Those children are falling through the cracks. There's families still in bondage to addiction, generational addiction, uh, generational health issues, just time and time again. And um, we've got to be there for those people because we're disciples of Jesus Christ. We are the face and the hands and the words of Jesus Christ in this world, in this community. What a great thing. If I still think, man, I don't know about you. Just give me a hand. Right? Is the Holy Spirit going to sweep through this place and just transform this community? And I, I believe it is. I believe it is. I believe big things are going to happen in this, this county, this region, and I think that we're going to be a part of it. But it's going to take a, a full-in commitment. Absolutely a full-in commitment to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, not just come to church. I beg you to take that. Take that responsibility. God will not leave you abandoned. He will not do that. You come in contact with people every day. They're just waiting to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're waiting to hear a word that will transform their life. You know them. You see them. The Holy Spirit's telling you, talk to that one. Share the story. Tell him about me. Tell him I died for him. Tell him he belongs to me. Tell him there's nothing I would not do for him or her. If you need encouragement, if you need anointing to carry out this, this, this message and, and what I've asked you to do, then now's the time. I'll anoint you. I'll pray hands over you. I'll, I'll lay hands on you. I'll pray over you. Anything to do to strengthen you and edify you so that when you walk out those doors that you're on fire for God, that you're going to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. You're going to find somebody this week Share the gospel with. If you find another believer that might be down, build them up. Equip them. Speak power into them. Pray boldly for them. Amen? We're in this together. We've got to stick together on this. Amen? And if you need that today, now's the time. The Holy Spirit just come in and, and just sweep you over and equip you. Heavenly Father, we're willing to do that. Because that's what we're called to do. That's what I'm called to do. Is to equip you to go out there and save lives, save souls. Amen? Amen.